we return to continue on with my series looking at specific individuals of note in the galaxy of the 41st millennium. Doubtless this series needs to pick up some pace, but you know how it is, today we will investigate a legendary figure within the Imperium who is also marked to soon spark a whole new wave of recruitment for 40k in Games Workshop's upcoming TV series. So for those of you who are new to 40k, I'll just note also that when it comes to specific aspects of the lore, there is almost no limit to how much detail you can drill down on, especially when it comes to tangents or associated information related to specific figures of factions, and as interesting and entertaining as this is, it's not always helpful for staying, say, on topic. So bearing this in mind, now and forever, if a detail or piece of subsidiary information is not included in any video, this is usually by choice, not by absence of memory. Also, today for this video I decided to have Siege Studios, my channel's sponsor, paint up for me Gregor Eisenhorn, as you can see right here. For one, it seemed fitting to showcase, but also it's a really good opportunity to see the work that Siege produces. If you're interested in getting a quote from Siege or want to learn more about painting from their Patreon, check out the links down below this video. And I'll note as well that this was not a freebie, I paid up for it myself, because Eisenhorn will be becoming an ever more important figure this year, and I wanted to add him to my collection. We'll take a closer look at the mini in detail toward the end of this video. If you want to find out more about Siege, as I say, check out the links directly below the video. So who is Gregor Eisenhorn? He is a human and a member of the Imperium, mankind's galaxy-spanning empire of over a million worlds, which constitutes the bulk of humanity in the current period. He is a member of what is known as the Inquisition, an intelligence gathering and policing authority who are granted broad discretion in their judgments, often operating alone but usually in command of an investigative or purging force. Inquisitors are some of the most feared human individuals in the galaxy, and this is primarily because of the highly minimal limitations placed upon their actions. In short, Inquisitors answer only to themselves and the Emperor of Man. We should briefly explore what an Inquisitor is. They are far from being seen as the saviours of the Imperium, as opposed to most other forces within the Imperium. Many worlds will actively do in fact all they can to avoid the attention of an Inquisitor. This often means doing so by any means necessary. Those desperate reasonings of planetary leaderships in an effort to avoid the eyes of an Inquisition is not unreasonable either. Because should you find an Inquisitor has taken a suspicious interest to your world, then it's anyone's guess as to what this might mean for your planet. But it's certainly at least uncommon that the attention of an Inquisitor would pass without any consequences. But on the lighter end of the scale, an Inquisitor might call for interrogations and access to projects or details surrounding a planet's activities. They might carry out, say, individual executions by their own hand upon anyone from a lowly slave worker to the highest members of a planet's nobility. But on the more extreme end of the scale, if a situation were deemed severe enough, they might even sign off on the destruction of an entire world via the planet-raising process of exterminatus. To enact any of this and more, all that is required will be their word, as no one with any sense would or should dare to question their authority. Even Imperial Astartes theoretically sit below an Inquisitor's authority, as their glorious father, the Emperor, sits rotting a Carrion King upon a golden throne, and he is in no practical position to remonstrate with those who might egregiously disagree with the Inquisition. I say in theory because of course some Astartes could choose to evade the entanglements of an Inquisitor, but others might readily aid them and seek their insight. It's certainly been the case that on occasion Inquisitors have say detained Astartes who as loyal servants of the Emperor must bow to their will. Many forget that Space Marines are not the rulers of humanity but they are its protectors, and although they wield power beyond estimation, they serve ordinary human citizens. Of course, this has been somewhat twisted over time as a result of the Ecclesiarchy and the Astartes now being viewed as the godlike progeny of the Holy Emperor, but all of these developments have at least to some degree muddied the water in terms of who serves and obeys who. Powerful as they are though, Inquisitors are far from being the singular deciding force of power in the Imperium, even though they do have a presence of that being the case. In fact, it's vast bureaucracy from the Lord Commander of the Imperium himself, all the way down to anonymous scribes who might accidentally destroy a world by mislabeling a trade requisition, Inquisitors do represent some of the most concentrated individual power in the bleak empire of humanity. 
They seek out would-be heretics, the corrupted and the corrupting. They hunt Xenos, mutant abominations, and will without hesitation or mercy purge those who might seek to sow the seeds of disruption and chaos throughout the worlds of mankind. Except that not all Inquisitors are tasked primarily with equal value or level of assignment. As is often the case now, some 10,000 years ago, the Emperor last dictated his will. Many institutions of mankind are then now subdivided into ideological orders who bicker and dispute among themselves the correct interpretation of the Emperor's will and how this should best be carried out. Again, much to the irony of it, humanity has slipped back into the grinding attrition of opinions much like the religions of old earth. And this was something the Emperor was always desperate to avoid, but now has spectacularly failed to rein in. So this is why many Inquisitors will shift ideologies and attachment to specific orders throughout their lifetimes. In fact, such is the fractured and often clouded nature of reality in the 41st millennium, and doubtless somewhat as a result of the hastily implemented founding of the Inquisition itself in the final days of the heresy, its arguably insufficient direction at its inception has consequently led to a slow fracture occurring over many millennia, now resulting in polarizing ideological inconsistencies. And these views are championed by different factions of the Inquisition who have slowly drifted into different ways of interpreting their overall mission, role, even the philosophical definitions of humanity and the Imperium itself. This fragmentation over a scale you might judge as being objective and logical and loyal on the one hand to full-blown conspiratorial extremism on the other means that the different orders of the Inquisition may find themselves waging small-scale civil wars. Thankfully, this is not something that is especially common, nor is it desired by anyone. Despite their spitting hatred for those who they perceive to be actively working against them, there is the awareness by all concerned that although, as we noted before, technically, yes, they do carry high authority, it's unlikely that Space Marine chapters and other Imperial forces would tolerate another civil war dragging the Imperium down, no matter who is creating it. This seems to be generally understood, and so any engagements between Inquisitorial orders are more likely to be skirmishes than anything else, with senior figures wielding at least plausible deniability at any required further investigations. It was a Vox Communications error, sir. We had no choice but to open fire on them, and so on. The Inquisition itself, though, is primarily split into three orders. The Ordo Xenos are the alien hunters, the Ordo Heretics deliver brutal punishment upon the heretics, and the Inquisitors of the Ordo Malleus are some of the few mortal humans who are able to stand against the nightmarish demons of the parallel void space known as the Warp, where only chaos exists and all of humanity's worst traits are physically poured into it, saturating it across what is anyway our perception of time. Gregor Eisenhorn belonged to that first order of the Ordo Xenos. To some, the Ordo Xenos is debatably the order carrying the least gravitas. They are important to be sure, in the same way that weeding your path and tending your lawn is important, lest they become overgrown. But trimming encroaching weeds offers little in the way of mystique. The Ordo Xenos are primarily focused upon one core objective, the extermination of that which is not of mankind. And when we say exterminate, we mean total obliteration. They serve to seek out and destroy the alien with extreme prejudice, to brutally hack them to pieces, beat and grind them into the dirt, purge their foul ugliness back from whence it came, and most importantly, never allow them to contaminate or constrain the grandeur, progress and purity of humanity. For it is only humanity who are destined to be the rightful rulers of the galaxy, and in the eyes of the Ordo Xenos, all others deserve nothing more than total annihilation. Now before I go on, I will also just mention something that confuses many in relation to the Ordos and also in relation to Gregor Eisenhorn. So just because an Inquisitor is aligned or attached to a specific Ordo like the Xenos or Malleus, this does not mean that they are restricted singularly to that path of investigation and this path only. For example, an Ordo heretic could begin an investigation about reports of a heretical cult only to discover it has Xenos-related origins. 
Now, at that point, they could continue on and deal with it entirely themselves, or maybe if they felt necessary, they might call in a fellow Inquisitor who specialises in that area. Now, this can obviously be played out in various combinations. You may be directed more towards missions and tasks which involve that discipline, as it were, and I say this because a lot of what Eisenhorn gets involved in is relating to the dark powers of the warp, which often leaves people asking, well, hang on, I thought he was the Ordo Xenos. He is, but that is not really important. And without wanting to go off on a really huge tangent here, I'll just also say that this is often true of other narratives within the Imperium. You often might hear about X-Force dealing with X-Situation, so you get the impression that they are the only ones qualified to handle that specific sort of task. It's just not the case, it's just that they're probably doing that because they're better trained or suited to it in one way or the other. So Gregor Eisenhorn initially aligned himself with what are referred to as Puritan Inquisitors. They believe in and enforce so-called traditional states of the Inquisition. This essentially means that they follow the letter of the Imperial law, yet they are still very hardline, uncompromising and merciless. Their polar opposites within the Order of the Inquisition are what are known as Radical Inquisitors. Puritans view this kind of thinking as heretical, because radicals generally operate under an ends justifying the means perspective, even if that means acquiring and using forbidden technology, or Xenos technology, or dark powers. The rationale for the radicals here is usually along the lines of the end being far more important than any contamination which happens along the way. And when it comes to technology, the idea being this stuff already exists, so why not just use it if it enables us to reach our goals more rapidly? This thinking is highly questionable for many in the Imperium already, but it is entirely abhorrent and appalling to Puritan Inquisitors. From the very beginning, Gregor Eisenhorn was, like many individuals in the Imperium, thrown into a dark reality that cares not for you or anyone you care about. As an emergent psyker, he was taken from his homeworld by the greatly feared black ships of the Telepathica, but would survive the ordeal and rise to become an acolyte and then qualified member of the Inquisition by the astonishingly young age of just 24 years old. Eisenhorn was, of course, capable of psychic abilities, and once he'd been trained properly to control his skills, he could use these abilities of telepathy and persuasion to compel others to follow his commands. These are not the heretics you're looking for. His powers in this regard were formidable. He was able to focus this mind control upon individuals, or even whole crowds, and as you can imagine, this in many ways could be a far more powerful weapon than even those who use psychic powers for offensive action. Now, some 18 years later and aged 40, Gregor was on course with a career that had already been progressing well. But it was around this time in the year of 240 M41 that things would become more complicated. When he would encounter a servant of chaos named Murdin Iclone in the Helican subsector, an old and important area of the Scarus sector, a cultural centre within Segmentum Obscurus, and this is the area in Galactic North. Iclone was a particularly unpleasant individual, a follower of Chaos and a Psyker, who would also use his powers to mind control others and even mind wipe them. Eisenhorn would hunt Iclone for several years, finally cornering him on the world of Hubris. And I do have to give you some detail about the world of Hubris because it's so stupid it would be a crime not to. The story goes that the original colonists who came to Hubris long ago and used long-range scans to decide to settle there in the first place, except upon arrival they found their systems had inaccurately represented the data of this world to them, and now after a 70-year voyage, they were stuck facing a planet that was basically nothing more than an ice world. It seems the nature of this was that whilst the planet was periodically habitable, its orbit meant that it would annually become swathed in ice and essentially completely uninhabitable for 11 out of its 29 month solar orbit. Yet despite this, the colonists decided they had little option other than to now settle here, and so they devised an ingenious plan to deal with the problem of living on a world incapable of supporting life for a third of its year. They would use their cryogenics from the ship's long voyage to essentially hibernate during this 11-month freeze, leaving behind a designated skeleton crew of 1% to maintain the facilities. And this 1% lived in what was known as the Sun Dome to shield them and allow them to live somewhat normally during this period. And it was on this world that Eisenhorn finally encountered Iclone after years in pursuit. Iclone had wanted to murder the entire hibernating population of the world so as to empower a figure known as Pontius Glore, 
For now, just know that Glor was a bad guy, and as a result of Eisenhorn's arrival, the scheme would be abandoned, although over 12,000 would still be murdered, and Eichlem was subsequently killed. In terms of that act itself, it's important to remember that when you're trying to empower, or if you're a worshipper of chaos, it's not enough to just kill a few individuals, because in the scope and the scale of what chaos is, a few individuals means absolutely nothing. If you want to get the attention and the power and the blessings of chaos, you need to be killing on a massive level. And these events would also bring into Eisenhorn's retinue Godwin Fischig, a member of the Adeptus Arbites, a highly capable individual both in combat and investigation, and also Eliza Beth Beckwin, who joined him as a result of the incident on Hubris. Gregor was quick to recognise Elizabeth as one of those rarest of individuals, a Null Psyker, otherwise known as a Blank. And you'll remember that Null Psykers are some of those who make up the dangerous individuals known as the Sisters of Silence, and also the individuals who power the devastating Psy Titans. Despite the obvious problems this might create, not least of all the repulsion Eisenhorn felt from her very presence, he recognised the high value she would bring to him, and so she was drafted into his retinue. Similarly to Fischig, she proved herself adept at undercover and investigative operations. All of this, though, would lead them into what is referred to as the Necrotuk Affair. After the incident on Hubris, their investigations led them to become curious about this individual of Pontius Glor, who had been executed by another Inquisitor some centuries previous. They decided investigating the House of Glor, who had attempted to distance themselves from Pontius, seemed a reasonable course of action. And they would discover something known as the Pontius. This was a dark crystal containing the spiritual essence of Pontius Glor. It became apparent that far from distancing themselves, the House of Glor were neck deep in heretical activity, and a cabal within their house had arranged to trade artifacts of a minor Xenos race, known as the Soruthi, in exchange for the Necrotuk which they had by chance discovered a millennia previous. But what was this Necrotuk? Well, it was a book, but a book of profane, arcane power that the Cabal of House Glor believed would empower them enough to be able to resist the Inquisition itself, and fulfilling their promise to resurrect Pontius Glor. Through the actions of Eisenhorn, his retinue, and Imperial Guard troops, they were able to prevent the House of Glor from acquiring the Dark Tome. But even slight exposure to it nearly caused his demise when he was assaulted by a Chaos Marine known as Mandragor, formerly of the Emperor's Children. However, he was tricked by Eisenhorn, who exploited him coming under the spell of the book similarly to himself, and in that moment, he was able to decapitate the Chaos Marine. This caused the Mandragore's body to combust, into which Eisenhorn placed the Necrotuk. And it would be this action which placed him in a conflict with inquisitors of the radical ideology who believed he should have retained the book for his research and to exploit its powers. Eisenhorn would be part of a subsequent assault on the Saruthi homeworld to purge and destroy the tainted Xenos race after it is revealed that the Saruthi are more than happy to trade the Necrotuk as they already had another copy of their own. And this incident would lead to a critically important event where Eisenhorn would first encounter the demon host known as Cherubel. Roughly a century passes since the incidents surrounding the Necrotuk, and Eisenhorn continues his investigations for the Imperium, encountering corrupted Imperial Guard, as well as suffering personal losses and injuries to himself. By 338 of M41, though, he would begin a new line of inquiry that is possibly his most notable and infamous investigation, that of the Inquisitor Quixus. On the hive world of Thracian Primaris, a great parade known as the Triumph was taking place to celebrate the victory over a civil war taking place in the Helican Sector. The parade was set to reach as far as 20 miles, containing several Astartes chapters, as well as anything like half a million guardsmen. It also would include 300 members of the Inquisition, including Gregor Eisenhorn and another Gideon Ravenor. The parade, though, was assaulted by Chaos aircraft, and many thousands were killed. This sparked 
a brief period on the planet of unrest and rioting. It led to the escape also of rogue psychers from Imperial Holding, and this was believed to be the goal of the assault that took place at a time when the Imperials would be preoccupied with their self-indulgent displays of success and power. More troubling though, was that the escaped psychers were classed as Alpha Plus. These designations are the rarest class of positive psionic level psychers, and Alpha Plus are basically beyond the scale of measured psychic power. Their powers are far beyond the hope of the individual being able to control them, and the Imperium consider them to be extremely dangerous individuals and an immediate threat to the Imperium itself. To put into perspective how dangerous an Alpha Plus Psyker could be, if they were able to control and channel their power, they could, for example, snap a Titan in half like a dry branch, or indeed summon entire legions of greater demons of chaos, whereas ordinary psychers and cultists will have an extremely difficult time even summoning one. Alpha Plus psychers are like white hot nodes of warp power in the real space. Thankfully they are very rare, but they are just off the scale in the danger that they present to the Imperium, and one might reasonably question the logic of holding all these individuals in one place. But regardless, Eisenhorn began investigations immediately, and they soon discovered that it was apparent that the escape of the psychers had been assisted by fellow Inquisitors, a extremely disturbing discovery. And this is when Eisenhorn found an Inquisitor Lyco in the company of Cherubel. And the unexpected reappearance of this demon host was very troubling for Eisenhorn to say the least. Eisenhorn would then decide to focus his further investigations on this reappearance and the significance of Cherubel, which would bring him to Cadia. And his arrival and investigation here on Cadia would lead Eisenhorn and his retinue to encounter another powerful demon host known as Profanity but not spelt how you imagine. It was only thanks to the Null Bequen that they were able to survive this encounter at all. But the demon was still powerful enough to physically melt Eisenhorn's power sword. Eisenhorn would vaporize the host body of the demon host, but then simply took possession of one of his associates and escaped. And this is when we see the beginnings of trouble and the muddied waters of loyalty begin in the mind of Eisenhorn, who would then also be arrested by one Inquisitor, Ozma, for consorting with demons. The events leading up to this and their resolution, for me, highlights the problematic nature of life for Inquisitors. Through no real intention or fault of their own, their activities and investigations may, and usually will, bring them into contact with, or result in, the manipulation of demons. Xenos and other warp entities, as well as associated condemned technology. And I think it's all too often assumed and presented very simplistically that Inquisitors are just hunters of the catch-all enemies of mankind, as well as the insinuation that they get off on the power trip of condemning any and all to death on the slightest whim. This caricature, this meme of the Inquisitor, is commonly how they're very lazily represented a condemned to death first, ask questions later kind of role, power tripping mad, a position that represents little more than the ultimate power trip. Except more often it appears in reality this is a very misleading representation and that even the opposite is true. Yes they do have far reaching and undeniable power, yet their existence is far from comfortable or all about just carrying out death sentences as and when for any minor infraction. They are far more occupied with investigation that are wrought with difficulty in terms of navigating the very fine line between just what is and isn't acceptable in the eyes of specific elements of the Imperium and fellow Inquisitors. The subtlety of what Inquisitors do within the Imperium is far more than just casual executions because they feel like it. And this is why, if you're not familiar already with the Eisenhorn trilogy of Xenos, Malleus and Heretics, these are essential reading and you should read them as soon as possible or audiobook them on Audible. But returning now to Eisenhorn and Inquisitor Ozma, who charges him with heresy and consorting with the demon. They also later accuse him of being involved with the Thracian Primaris incident and the escape of the Alpha Plus Psychers. After three months of Eisenhorn being interrogated by Ozma's staff, Lord Inquisitor Rorken had apparently persuaded Grand Master Orsini to have Eisenhorn extradited to Thracian Primaris, where he would stand trial before a magistrate tribunal of the Ordo Malleus and the Officio of Internal Prosecution. But before the black ships arrived to transport Eisenhorn, 
his retinue would break him out and they fled aboard a rogue trader, Maxilla's ship. At this point, Eisenhorn is now declared an outcast by the Inquisition and an enemy of the Imperium. Eisenhorn himself was obviously now all too well aware that clearing his name was absolutely paramount and so he needed to now refocus on both locating Crixos and this brought him to engage and discuss with the spirit of Pontius Glor. And finally, when he would locate Inquisitor Crixus, he would also encounter the demon hosts of Profanity and Cherubal once again. With the heretical tome of Crixus, Eisenhorn was able to banish the demons back into the warp. Yet as he conversed with Cherubal, the twisted plans of the demon become all too clear. As Cherubal said itself, when the warp is in you as it is in me, you see time from all angles. You see what will be and what will come, what someone here now will do in a century or two, what someone there has done a thousand years in the past. You see the possibilities. It's small fragments like these as well which go into the puzzle piece of how time is perceived in the warp. I know that many of you want me to get toward that discussion of time in the warp again, but you see it's small fragments like this that enable us to see that demons and other entities in the warp are really able to see a broad picture of time and the events that occur in real space in a much more kind of fluid and disorganised fashion, seeing everything all together. But it was only after Eisenhorn had banished the demon host did he come to contemplate how he had been manipulated Musing to himself, I saw the years of enslavement it had endured at Crixus' hands, the torments of its binding, the great forbidden text of the Malus Codicium, whose arcane knowledge Crixus had used to create his demon hosts, and I realised that I had given Cherubal exactly what it wanted after all. Freedom. Eisenhorn would then finally encounter Crixus, and it became apparent that as a radical inquisitor, Crixus believed that he would be able to recreate one of the pylons of Cadia, powered by the Alpha Plus Psychers, so as to collapse the Eye of Terror itself. This had been his grand radical scheme. Eisenhorn would kill Crixus in combat and his plans dismantled. The Psychers recovered and imprisoned on black ships, most too dangerous to be held permanently, and were executed. After this great achievement in revealing the whole Torrid affair and defeating the demon hosts and Crixus, not to mention recovering the psychers in great quantities of documents and materials, the accusations of Inquisitor Ozma could no longer stand, and Eisenhorn's period as an outcast and renegade was obviously rescinded. It turned out, though, that Eisenhorn had kept a dark tome of knowledge known as the Malus Codicium used by Crixus for himself, and this would become an instrumental tool for the downward spiral that was the next chapter in his life. Eisenhorn greatly resented the way that Cherubal had manipulated him. With the Caddisium, he would learn the dark skills needed in binding and creating demon hosts, just as Crixus himself had learned. Cherubal is an infamous demon because of its association with Eisenhorn, but also because it stands as a great example over just how demons are able to manipulate mortals in the dark future. Demons are able to see a far broader, non-linear perspective of time via the warp, and they're capable of planning vast schemes that are beyond the understanding and the comprehension of mortals who may not have the mind or the knowledge capable of realising just how they are being used. This has happened on many occasions to Inquisitors, another example being Inquisitor Sabathiel. Cherubal was originally a demon prince of the feral world Clanar II, it held dominion over the local population who without much effort came into worshipping the demon as a god. Inquisitor Crixus defeated him and then by use of the Malus Caddisium enslaved it as a demon host. A demon host being basically a demon that is bound to a living human, enslaved to their will. And while this is quite obviously insanely heretical, this is an example of something a radical inquisitor might attempt, but more commonly chaos cults will seek to summon demon hosts, offering a host soul for possession. The difference being that a cult will usually be subject to the will and power of a demon, whereas a radical inquisitor will often be able to dominate and control the will of the demon, although they are not necessarily entirely successful at this, and especially over time, as already stated, a demon's grand scheme can undermine the apparent control a mortal has over them. Either that, or their insidious nature will slowly poison the mind of the Inquisitor over many, many years. 
The following period quickly becomes dark and by now an unstoppable descent into radicalism for Eisenhorn. While originally his encounters with demons were unjustly reasoned by Inquisitor Ozma as being corrupting and evidence of Eisenhorn consorting with demons, his manipulation by Cherubal, his acquisition of the Malus Caedicium and the seeds of radicalism sown by Crixus were leading Eisenhorn down a path from which there would be no route back. Eisenhorn's own associate, Godwin Fishing, once had told him that he had been warned to stay away from any hint of radical sympathy, stating to him, Trust me, Eisenhorn, if I ever thought you were, I'd shoot you myself. Eisenhorn would once again encounter the heretic Fade Thuring, who had killed one of his retinue Midas Betancourt many years before, and back then Fade was merely a minor chaos cultist, but he had escaped the revenge of the Inquisitor. Now Eisenhorn encountered him after travelling to a world of Dura where Chaos Titans were being stored. Eisenhorn and his team caught up with Thuring, but not before he managed to activate a Warlord Chaos Titan. Eisenhorn himself had no deep understanding of Titans, but he knew enough to know that they primarily operated by means of a psychic interface, and that therefore their problem could be overcome by the use of psychic power, something that they had plenty of options of using to approach the situation. Their objective would be to destroy the link between Thuring and the Chaos Titan, and Eisenhorn speculated that by using a rune staff, he and another Psyker could use their power to break into the Titan's consciousness, and then his associate, Bequin, the Blank, would also hold on to this staff, and using her null ability, they would amplify this to destroy the psychic connection of the Titan completely. Eisenhorn and associate Rassi found themselves in the world of the warp and the mind of the Chaos Titan, the Crua Vault, describing this as the Titan's memories, its mental landscape, and this was revealed to them, which, incidentally, contains yet another specific reference to the fact that Titans originate from the Dark Age of Technology and not created originally by the Mechanicum on Mars. When they found themselves within this Titan's consciousness, Eisenhorn spoke about what he saw within the memories of the Titan. May the God Emperor spare me. I saw such things then. I stood on the brink and peered into the abyss of the Titan's memories. I saw cities die in flames. I saw legions of Imperial Guard incinerated. I saw space marines die in their hundreds, scurrying around my feet like ants. I saw planets catch fire, burn to ashes. I saw Imperial Titans, proud warlords, burst apart and die under the onslaught of my hands. I saw the gates of the Imperial Palace on terror through a blizzard of fire. I saw down many thousands of years. I saw Horus, vile and screaming his wrath. I saw the whole heresy played out in front of my eyes. I saw the Age of Strife and witnessed firsthand the Dark Age of Technology that preceded it. I fell plummeting through history, through the stored memory of Krua Vault. I saw too much. I started to scream. Rassi slapped me hard around the face. Gregor, come on now, we're almost there. This was when Eisenhorn's null companion Bequin would take the staff and was tragically killed in the process. While being a null, the process that Eisenhorn had speculated could bring down the Titan created what might be described as a psychic backdraft, as Bequin connected herself to the powerful amplified psychic rod, the all-powerful sentience of the Titan had entered her mind and all were thrown back from the staff. But Bequin was tossed as much as 12 meters back away from the staff and as she did so, bones shattering upon her hitting the stone walls of the chapel they rested in. Bequin had been Eisenhorn's companion for a significant period of time, and the grief of this coupled with the fact that his plan had failed to take down the Titan, and the chaos of Thuring was still bearing down on them, caused him a considerable degree of guilt and despair. And it is, of course, situations like this when people will hear the whispering calls of chaos and the warp to take out the easy way to listen to the promises of the demons. More of Eisenhorn's entourage would be killed by the Titan, and in the depths of his despair, knowing he had no way of countering something like a Titan, after waiting so many years to carry out the revenge on Fade Thuring, his last option was an unthinkable one. Eisenhorn held the rune staff and recited the words he had spent decades studying from the Malus Codicium. He attempted to rationalize his actions to himself, hearing the years of conversations with his associates from centuries previous, 
Yet he was not in that place and time now. For Eisenhorn, the line between heresy and purity were no longer clear or black and white. The line between the two had become thinner and thinner over time, and now that fine line had become a blur. It was not distinct or clearly marked. This was the moment that Eisenhorn would finally cross into the ideology of radical inquisition. He would unleash Cherubel and command it to destroy the Titan that was moments from killing them all. The skull facing of the Titan would crack and explode from the inside out, the huge war machine coming crashing to the ground. In one single release of demonic power, Cherubel had killed both the Titan and Eisenhorn's foe, Fade Thuring. Yet the demon was not acting at the command of Eisenhorn, he had unleashed it into the Materium, and now it turned its attentions upon him. It was not bound to a demon host, he had no weapon to fight it, and Cherubel of course did not hesitate in tormenting Eisenhorn with his impending doom. Cherubel's assault was paused when an old man Dronicus pushed it back by use of an Aquila from the chapel, screaming the words of worship for the Emperor, and this milder delay enabled Eisenhorn to commit further acts of unthinkable heresy. Bastian Vevok was a young idealistic Ordozinos inquisitor, a strict Puritan and formerly Inquisitor Osma's interrogator. He had barely served the Inquisition for half a year when he was sent to the world of Dura to assist Eisenhorn's hunt for heretic Thuring. Vevok proved to be quite the annoyance by his proximity to Eisenhorn with what might best be described as apple polishing behaviour. Vevok had been badly wounded though by the Titan assault and now lay in a terrible state within the chapel. Eisenhorn approaching the young Inquisitor, who assumed that Eisenhorn was there to comfort and help him. However, his line of questions to Vervik immediately made him panic as to the older Inquisitor's intentions, and with fair reason, as Eisenhorn proceeded to then use Vervik's own blood to mark out symbols across his broken body. The old man Dronicus was heard outside screaming as Cherubal had finally found the power to melt the Aquila. In his last moments, the innocently naive Inquisitor Bastian Vervik still did not fully comprehend just what it was that Eisenhorn was attempting to do, as he used the boy Inquisitor as a tool by which to entrap Cherubal with the few words, In servitutem abduco, I bind thee fast forever into this host. And it was done, and Cherubal was once again trapped. Bastian Vervik was of course dead, his corpse floating above the ground while Eisenhorn fashioned a leash to tow him along, much to the complete abhorrent disgust of Godwin Fischig who questioned Eisenhorn that Vervik was dead before he was used as a host, wasn't he? To which Eisenhorn gave no answer. All of these events would prove greatly suspect for his retinue who were becoming ever more troubled by the actions and evasive answers of their master inquisitor. Eisenhorn by now was already questioning things himself, on the one hand believing that he was headed on the right path with a renewed sense of purpose, but on the other contemplating the possibility that he was now no better than the heretic Crixus and had become trapped in the same darkness so easily and without even realising it. He would also ponder on the possibility that the Malus Caudicium had been slowly poisoning his mind and that this was how he found himself able to cross the line into binding a fellow Inquisitor as a demon host. Yet he also saw that via the Necrotuk and the Codicium he had been able to achieve great things that he could not have done so otherwise. It was a difficult ideological argument for him to wrestle with and one which he found to be increasingly challenging to rationalise. Eisenhorn noted though that unlike other demonic artefacts and tomes which often seemed alive to speak or whisper in some manner, the Codicium had always seemed silent. And this silence was suspicious to him. Was its benign appearance as just a book far from that truth and that in reality it had been doing far more damage than any other dark object that he possessed? That unlike other things which an Inquisitor would know were evil, the danger and power of the Malus Codicium was that it did not present itself in this way. It was instead an insidious thing that poisoned your mind without you even realising it. And by the time you came to understand this, it would already be too late. And this epiphany deeply troubled Eisenhorn, but he was already too invested to do much about it by now. Pontius Glor had been a name that echoed across Eisenhorn's lifetime, beginning far back with his investigations on hubris and the discovery of the Necrotuch. The House of Glor and the discovery of these cabals, factions and individuals who sought to use chaos to their own end. 
Glaw's considerable intelligence and his personality had been preserved in a psi crystal by his noble family, and this had been what the House of Glaw had been attempting to resurrect him into a mortal body with so long ago. This crystal had been entrusted to the care of Majos Buer, and some years later Eisenhorn had conferred with Glaw using the crystal, which had led to his discovery of the demon hosts. And this had then ultimately led to his execution of Crixus and his relationship with Cherubel. However, in order to get Glaw to cooperate, Eisenhorn had promised that Majos Buer would fashion a body for Glaw to inhabit, believing quite stupidly that even if this was fashioned, he would never be able to escape. But seemingly inevitably, escape Glaw did. And now Eisenhorn and his entourage found themselves investigating events that had seemed to point toward them being at the direction of Pontius Glaw. Many members and sites of Eisenhorn's operations had been coming under attack or even been destroyed and murdered, and after considerable cross-referencing, they came to the conclusion that Glaw was the prime candidate for these crimes. Yet Eisenhorn also speculated that it may well be that Glaw was not specifically seeking revenge against him and his followers, but that perhaps Glaw was simply looking to eliminate any who held any knowledge of him, so that he might be able to then carry out future plans without the fear of somebody recognising, speaking up about the threat that he posed to the Imperium. Eisenhorn would reveal all of his actions so far to the rogue trader Tobias Maxilla, who had originally helped him in pursuing Eichlone all those years ago. But after laying out all of his controversial actions, he felt sure that Maxilla would condemn them. But surprisingly to Gregor, he did not. In fact, on the contrary, Maxilla gave the analogy that all those who had died as a result of Eisenhorn's missions, his associates who died because of demons and heretics, were still all doing the great work of the Emperor, and that ultimately all Eisenhorn was guilty of was making difficult choices so as to best serve the Emperor that where a general might command infantry on a battlefield, he uses people and elements of society to achieve his victories. While Eisenhorn had likely suspected while contemplating the Caddisium that he had by this stage lent in heavily toward the radical view, it was his conversation with Maxilla that cemented his realisation. That he was doing the Emperor's work, even though it meant bending the rules as it were. But using a rogue trader like Maxilla, who by his own admission regularly broke the rules of the Imperium cleanly for nothing more than to just satisfy his own desires, was not perhaps the most objective point of reference to be gauging oneself by. But still, it helped calm the conscience of Eisenhorn. This though would also lead Eisenhorn to realise that he was absolutely isolated and could not call for help from the Inquisition. How would he be able to do such a thing, as he exclaimed, what could I say? Pontius Glaw is exterminating my forces? Where did he come from? My Lord Grand Master. Well, to be honest, I've known of his existence for centuries, but I kept him hidden from you, and he's only up and around now because I decided to give him a body? And this was not to mention, of course, any omission related to things like the Caddisium and Cherubel. This was only further confirmed as his longtime friend and associate Godwin Fishig abruptly left the retinue one evening. Eisenhorn was able to track him down, but ultimately they would part ways, unable to reconcile their differences that were now laid bare with no way to reasonably resolve the situation. This unfortunately led not long after to Fishig believing it would be in the best interests of all to turn Eisenhorn over to the Puritans, to save him from himself and present his actions having any further consequence that might cause harm to the Imperium or those around him. Inquisitor Ozma, who had never apologised to Eisenhorn for his previous attempts to sanction the Inquisitor, along with Inquisitor Haldane and a host of stormtroopers, took custody of Eisenhorn, his retinue, and boarded the ship Essene. They didn't much approve of rogue trader Maxilla either, whose body had been significantly augmented over centuries. And after a brief interrogation, Cherubel would burst from one of the ship's astropaths and a brutal fight broke out, with Inquisitor Haldane taking on the cheerful Cherubel, who was burning guardsmen, seemingly at will. Meanwhile, Ozma was fighting one-to-one -one with Eisenhorn. And again, Eisenhorn struggling to hold his own, but Maxilla would deliver a fatal shot to Ozma, vaporising his head clean from his shoulders, killing him in a single blast. The shot had come from a ring on the rogue trader's finger, which still glowed brightly. A rare digital weapon, a relic of ancient times. Inquisitor Haldane had been trapped and was slowly now being burned alive by psychic fire. Cherubel bored with the dying human, 
teased Eisenhorn about his impending suffering, as he always delighted in doing. Eisenhorn stood firm with another newer member of his team, Alina Coy, a blank and a null, who was far from being described as weak, but certainly not of the strongest mental disposition. Her null abilities were all that stood between them and destruction, but regardless, she was still crying and scared beyond all rational thought at the sight and threats of the demon Cherubal. Eisenhorn would recall some of the words of the Malus Caudicium, and it would be enough to drive back Cherubal temporarily as it reeled from the power of the tome's words. Eisenhorn and Alina would flee, only to run into his old friend, Godwin Fischig, now aboard the ship. Fischig tries to convince Eisenhorn once again to choose between surrender to the Inquisition or death, but Fischig is tragically executed by one of Eisenhorn's retinue. Inquisitor Haldane would then survive this incident with the demon, but was horrifically wounded and would take a great deal of augmenting to recover his incinerating all over Burns. Strangely, he never revealed to the Inquisition the ultimate fate of Grandmaster Ozma, and the reasons for him doing this are unknown. Eisenhorn's team did succeed in binding Cherubal once again, but as was often the case, it ended up being a traumatic affair, which resulted in the death of yet another of his associates. Cherubal, though, would become greatly necessary for what they would soon face, because shortly after their confrontation with the Inquisitors, Eisenhorn and his retinue finally came face to face with Pontius Glor. And their inevitable showdown would ensue, Glor being considerably more powerful than Eisenhorn, and although he has Cherubal, Glor's own demon host was again far more powerful. But through some sly misdirection, Eisenhorn would use the promise of the Malus Caudicium and all of its knowledge and information to focus the attention of Glor, who could scarcely believe that Eisenhorn would be stupid enough to have brought such an item with him that he himself coveted so greatly. Yet his wide-eyed desires quickly turned to despair as Eisenhorn tore the book apart and immolated it before his very eyes. Glor, panicking and distraught at the critical loss of dark knowledge turning to ash before him, was scrabbling around to collect what he could of the dark tome. But this wild distraction was exactly what Eisenhorn desired. He would tear into the host's cybernetic body constructed by the Mechanicus, slashing at its chest, driving it back with follow-up blows, and finally splitting Glor's head apart, sending metallic shards and glass shattering across the floor. After vanquishing his nemesis, completing his centuries-long saga, Eisenhorn would strangely disappear from sight. It's reasonable that the loss of so many of his associates had taken its toll, coupled with his own uncertainties about where he placed himself and his value within the scale of inquisitional ideology. The deaths of nearly all of his closest companions, though, seemed to always weigh especially heavily upon him, not to mention his continual manipulation by so many other corrupting external forces. He did appear from time to time after these affairs, but his death was speculated upon, but never confirmed. There are no further records of Inquisitor Eisenhorn listed within Imperial archives, and nor is there any mention of an entity known as Cherubal. But given the darkness the Imperial mankind currently faces, could it be that Eisenhorn has survived to this time, and could even make a reappearance somewhere in the future? Now we'll finish today by taking a look at the fantastic Eisenhorn miniature that Siege Studios painted up for me. Now Siege specialise in painting characters and single models, they of course provide services for full army builds as well. And I know several people here who have already used their services and showcased these to me. Siege also offer both painting services and tuition, and I've been signed up to their Patreon for a while now. Now as you can see here through Patreon, they provide video painting tutorials 
like this Eisenhorn model itself. This Eisenhorn model actually was up there, so you can see how they painted it, the different techniques they used for various stages, so that you can obviously follow along, and this is going to be far better than just a PDF download alone. As I've been getting back into my miniatures, I've wanted to collect more and more pieces and some individuals that I can just keep as singular miniatures to look at. I was really happy with how this Eisenhorn turned out, although as you guys know, painting is a really big part of Warhammer for me, and I recently showcased my own painting skills, but it's still sometimes nice to actually have somebody else produce a miniature for you to just add to your collection. And I like this combination of lore with miniatures from time to time, so I'll probably get some others done in the future. But if you want to check out Siege, find out more about their services or get a quote for your own project, check out the link directly below this video. And we're straight on to the next big video, which is going to be coming up very soon, and I think it's one that you guys are going to enjoy very much. I'll just finish by saying, obviously, Eisenhorn is going to be soon developed into a series. This is one of several projects Games Workshop seem to be working on. This is primarily the reason why I wanted to give you guys an overview of Eisenhorn. So let me know your thoughts about how you would like to see that series styled down below. Thanks as always for your continued support guys. I'll be seeing you in the next one.